Great to be with you again. My name is Jason Dexter from Study and Obey, and today we're continuing our study in the book of Revelation, coming to chapter 7. So chapter 7 is a very interesting chapter because it's sandwiched right in between two chapters which are dealing with God's judgments, which he's going to be pouring out against the world. And so sandwiched between these two chapters of God's justice, God's judgment, his holiness, is this chapter which highlights even in the midst of his judgment, God is very merciful. And so we have to understand that Revelation shows us different aspects of God's character, not just his justice or his wrath against sin, but also his mercy and that he keeps giving people opportunities to believe and follow him. So let's read through Revelation 7 and we'll go ahead and discuss it. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali. 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and honor and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So this is just a wonderful chapter showing us God's mercy, and that even in the middle of the tribulation, he is working. He's saving people both from the tribes of Israel, and he's also saving many, many Gentiles from around the world. Uh, So let's go through, Uh, we're going to pick out some of the verses, points, and topics and discuss what it means and also how we can apply those principles today. So what we see in verse 1, he says, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, and he says they are holding back the winds of the earth, somehow holding back these four winds. Oftentimes in the Bible, four winds is used to describe something global, coming from the four corners of the earth, north, south, east, and west. In this passage, the wind seems to be God's judgment on the world. We've seen God's judgment, which is coming on the world for their sin because of his wrath and because of his holiness. But here in verse 1, the winds are being held back. The judgment is being held back from harming the earth. Held back until when and for how long? Verse 3 says, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So if you move forward to chapter 8, the trumpet judgments begin. And most of the trumpet judgments are 
targeting the Earth's ecosystem, including what we see right here, the sea, the Earth, and the trees. And so what's happening in this passage is these angels are being commanded to wait. Don't launch the trumpet judgments yet. Don't start these judgments upon the earth. And wait until something happens. Wait until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. God's people are going to be sealed and are going to be protected. And that reminds us that even in the midst of judgment, God is showing mercy. His judgment is not wild, chaotic, or random. It's not like a parent who loses his temper and then uh, hits or abuses his child. No, God is in complete control. It's released, his, his judgment is released exactly according to the time and exactly according to the de degree that he so chooses, his perfect choosing. So his judgments are firm, but at the same time, he shows grace and mercy, allowing for repentance. God is in complete control of this entire timeline, and he's releasing each thing according to his specific plan. And it's, it's a comfort for us that God is merciful and patient because if he wasn't, then the earth would have been destroyed a long time ago. A lot of times people think, man, uh, why doesn't God punish sin? He allows all of these evil things. What we normally mean when we say that is, is I hope God will punish other people's sin. Not I hope God will punish mine. So God is going to release his judgment against the world and against sin. But even in the midst of it, he's going to be saving many, many people. So we should be thankful to him for his mercy and make sure that we receive his offer of salvation while there's time. Uh, as a side point, one other application we can learn from this is maintain control of our emotions. This could be especially applicable to parents. Don't just unleash your anger upon your children and lose your temper. Uh, if you're angry or maybe you even lose control, go to a quiet place first for a period of time to calm down. Discipline should be under control and according to biblical principles. Discipline should be given in a very measured way. So make sure that you are uh, in control before you discipline your children. So going forward, we see that God is going to seal 144,000 people. Uh, now, throughout the New Testament, we see that God does seal believers. Uh, we'll look at a few verses for that. Ephesians 1.13, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So notice in this passage, it is the Holy Spirit who he indwells a believer, and that's a sealing, that's a guarantee of that believer's salvation. We'll also look at 2 Corinthians 1.22. It says, Who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The same thing, the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee of our salvation. And John 6.27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. So what is this seal that we see in these verses? The seal is an invisible one. It's an invisible mark signifying the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The seal that we have now in the New Testament church age uh, is the Holy Spirit in our hearts, showing we belong to God, we are under his protection, and that is invisible. Now, later in Revelation, we're going to see that the Antichrist is also going to require his followers to take a mark of loyalty, called the mark of the beast. This will prove that they belong to him. It will be a visible symbol of their allegiance. Now, in th this seal for the believers for the 144,000 is also a visible one, because here it says that the seal is going to be on their foreheads on their foreheads. So you don't do an invisible seal on someone's forehead. A forehead is really the most visible part of you. When you uh, see someone or meet someone, then your face is what they're going to see. 
and remember. And so this terminology here in Revelation 7, 3 is quite different from the terminology of the more uh, generic sealing seen elsewhere in the New Testament, that invisible indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, specifically mentioning the forehead would be very odd if it just means that the Holy Spirit indwells them or that they're under God's protection. Another reason to think this seal in Revelation will be a visible one is that the mark of the beast is going to be visible. So the ranks are going to be clearly defined. Satan will have his army of followers who are loyal to him, uh, that, that you can see them, you can know who they are. They will all have the mark showing their loyalty to him. And at the same time, God is going to have a group of followers who are loyal to him and that has a, have a seal from him, a mark showing their loyalty to God. Uh, in Deuteronomy 6, it tells us that believers are commanded to write God's word on our foreheads and on their hands. So words written on your hands, just like a watch, you can easily check it, look at it, and remind yourself of God's words. But on your forehead is something that you really can't see, especially at that time when they didn't even uh, really have mirrors. So what's on your forehead is for other people to see, to identify the fact you're a believer. So this seal shows other people, I identify with Christ, I belong to him, and I am following him. Uh, an application for us is that we should live our life that way. We shouldn't be an invisible or a hidden Christian trying to hide our faith or trying to blend in with society. If you want to follow Christ, make that choice clear uh, in your own mind and then identify with him publicly so that other people know you're a follower of Jesus. They can see through your words, through your behavior, that you are his disciple. So it seems these 144,000 are sealed in a visible way to quickly identify them as followers of God. As the sealed, they'll likely have a special protection from God's judgment. If you think back in the Bible on when other judgments like this were poured out on the earth, you can probably think of Exodus, right? And so in the book of Exodus, for many of those plagues and judgments, the Israelites were immune. God made a separation. He differentiated between the unbelieving Egyptians and the believing Israelites. And those who believed in him were not subjugated to those plagues, but they were protected. Uh, it's very likely that this seal in Revelation also means that these 144,000 believers uh, will not be affected by these plagues, or at least not directly affected by these plagues. Uh, this is not in the text. This is more like an educated guess. So what is their mission? What are these 144,000 people going to be doing? Well, in verse 9, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. And then these people were all standing in front of the throne, worshiping God. So after what? After the sealing of the 144,000, you see them all from, from these tribes. After that, there was a great multitude of believers. So it looks like that these believers, and in fact, it says uh, they are standing before the throne. Um, in some other passage, it says they came out of the great tribulation, Oh yeah, sorry, verse 14, let me find that. Verse 14, he says, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. So this great multitude was saved during the great tribulation. How? I believe that they were saved through the ministry and evangelism of the 144,000 because first God chose 144,000 special, uh, we can say special witnesses or evangelists. And then after they do their mission, many, many believers from all over the world come to know him. So these 144,000 likely have the mission to evangelize the world. And this public witnessing in a super dangerous time when the Antichrist wants to kill all believers means they aren't going to last very long unless they have some kind of special protection. And I believe this mark, this seal, probably gives them some special protection from God, at least for a period of time until their mission is accomplished. Uh, from the second half of this chapter, we see that their mission is extremely fruitful. Huge numbers will come to faith in Christ. So who are these 144,000? Well, the passage tells us. It says that they are from every tribe 
of the sons of Israel. Now, throughout scripture, it's prophesied that the Jews will finally accept Jesus as Messiah as a nation and come back to him. Uh, we can see that in Romans 11, 25 and 20 through 27. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Okay, so what he says here is don't be confused. Don't think that God is completely rejected or turned away from Israel and that they are outside of his plan, that he has abandoned them. He says there's a partial hardening until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. So right now, God is primarily dealing with the Gentiles through his church. In the tribulation period, he will primarily be dealing with again, through the nation of Israel. Uh, we see many things about uh, the temple and the covenant and the peace treaty and the holy city, Jerusalem, and many, many, many things in the book of Revelation as we go through are going to be related to the Jews. God is going to be using these events to bring the nation back to himself. Right now and for the last 2,000 years, most Jews do not accept Jesus as their Messiah, although he fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah in his first coming, and then some more he later will fulfill in his second coming. So the, Gen the Jews as a group deny Jesus. That doesn't mean every single one uh, doesn't believe and denies Jesus, but most of them do not believe. And then in Revelation, God is going to bring most of them back to himself again. And so most of them will believe. So I believe these 144,000 uh, witnesses or evangelists from the different tribes of Israel are like a first fruits. They're like the first ones who are coming to Christ of the Jews during the tribulation. And then they'll preach in many, many more until finally the whole nation as a group, not every individual, will come to the Lord. Uh, we also see that there are 12,000 from each tribe. Uh, a natural question would be, well, how can there be 12,000 from those northern tribes? Because 10 of the tribes were exiled by the Assyrians. So how, how, can, that, uh, how can that be? Are there descendants still around? If you look online, there are many, many articles, a lot of them bogus, about these lost tribes of Israel. Uh, but I believe that these tribes, some of their descendants... Uh, are found in the southern kingdom. Uh, we can see that in a couple of biblical texts. For example, Luke 2.36. This is many hundreds of years after the Assyrian exile, and it says there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. So there was someone, a descendant of the tribe of Asher, living in the southern kingdom. Uh, we also know that Paul was a Benjamite. We know that John the Baptist was a Levite. So there were different tribes represented in the southern kingdom. Now for many, the lineage of their tribes going back now uh, 2,500 years or more is very, very difficult to keep track of. But we can be sure of this. God knows. God knows all of those who belong to him. God knows every single Jew who has any uh, blood from any of these 12 tribes. Nowadays, you can have a DNA test and find out, okay, I'm 3% I'm uh, from this country and I'm 7% from that ethnicity. And you can find out a lot about your ancestry through a DNA test. So even though a person might be far away, far removed from their country for a long time, they still have some of that uh, blood from their ancestors still there. So these are most likely not 100% purely belonging to that tribe. Uh, but there were many mixed marriages in their ancestry, and so many would descend from more than one tribe. Are these literal uh, numbers, 12,000, or are they symbolic? Uh, many believers argue about this point, uh, that, that 144,000 is symbolic for the whole nation. Uh, certainly the symmetry of this, about 12,000 from each tribe, mm, does make it appear. Maybe there's some symbolism there. 
uh, we don't really know. Uh, we can take this at face value um, that it appears there's 12,000 from each tribe and some scholars think this may be symbolic. Uh, either way, it shows that God is going to be saving many, many uh, Jews at this point in time uh, in the future during the tribulation. Uh, if you read through, you'll notice that one tribe is not mentioned, and that's the tribe of Dan. Uh, there's some speculation that uh, Dan was excluded because they were the first tribe to turn to idolatry in the Old Testament. All right, now going forward to the second half of this, we see this great multitude. There's going to be a great soul harvest, even during the tribulation. While God is bringing judgment to the world for its rebellion, these same judgments are an act of mercy because they're a warning to repent before it is too late. The witnesses from all over the world are going to be sharing the good news. There's going to be supernatural signs, cosmic signs. Uh, all kinds of things are going to be going on. Uh, the sea turning to blood and asteroids hitting the earth and the sun and the moon being darkened and many, many more. And these supernatural signs will be fulfilling these prophecies. We're studying in the book of Revelation prophesied at least 2,000 years ahead of time. And all of this is going to serve to bring about a huge harvest among those who finally decide to follow Jesus. And it's going to be huge. It says that there's so many that no one could number it. And again, these are just people coming out of the Great Tribulation. And so there's a massive number of people coming to Christ. Sometimes it's easy to read the book of Revelation and be discouraged. Wow, there's so much destruction there's wrath, there's judgment, and there's so many people who are being lost. They're worshiping the beast and, and taking the mark, and they're being lost for eternity. But at the same time, God is doing a great work, and he's bringing in vast numbers of people into his kingdom. And he's reaching into places, perhaps, that have never been reached into before. So there will be representatives from every people group on earth says from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Jesus prophesied that as well, Matthew 24, 14. The gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The gospel is going out to all nations. So throughout scripture, we see God's desire to see people saved from every people group on the planet. It's not going to be a kingdom composed only of one or several favored countries. If there's anything in the Bible that reminds us that God loves all people regardless of their country, their background, their ethnicity, their skin color, it's this. We are all loved and equal in God's sight. Uh, not because we have great value of ourselves, but because God has chosen to put value on us. He has chosen to love us in spite of our own sins and shortcomings. This is an exciting thing. All the language groups and all of the peoples who have ever existed will be represented in front of the throne of God. Now, that doesn't just mean there will be an American there, for example, but it means every minority people group, no matter how small that minority is, will also be represented in front of God's kingdom. Scriptures like these should serve as motivation for us, and they have served as motivation for many missionaries going throughout all the world to take the gospel and reminding us we need to be targeting unreached peoples who have little or no access to the gospel. So an application for us, how can you support this movement? What can you personally do to see the gospel advance in every corner of the world? Now near where I live, there's some people who sometimes give out flyers on the street and they're paid by the number of flyers they give out. So they're given a big stack of flyers and they give out these flyers as invitations to go to a restaurant or a gym, for example. Uh, some of these people giving out flyers aren't very eager or enthusiastic. They might just put the pile of flyers on the ground next to them and then surf on their phone and they don't give away many flyers. Others of them are quite bold and they will walk right up to you and give you a flyer and invite you to uh, the gym or to 
the restaurant. And at the end of the day, they've probably given away all of their flyers. Well, think about it this way. We have been given an invitation that we can invite others to join this great celebration at the end of time in front of the Lamb, in front of His throne. Are we inviting people? Are we just holding our stack of flyers and then doing some other stuff and being easily distracted? Or are we inviting other people to join? I'm excited not only that I can be there and see this spectacular sight in celebration, but I can also invite others. What a privilege and how exciting would it be for you at that time to be standing worshiping the King of Kings with people around you who you invited in your invitation, you're sharing the gospel with them, affected their eternal destiny. The joy of that moment will be unbelievable. What a treasure. So what will all of these people be doing before the throne? It says they're going to be worshiping. They're going to be worshiping. God created us to worship him. That's what we are designed to do. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. He will receive the worship that he deserves and we will joyfully give it. And all through here we see the worship. Verse 10, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. We'll be thanking him that we have been saved. And verse 12, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. We'll be describing all of his wonderful character qualities. So again, verse 14, it says that these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. It is strong evidence and reminder that even during the tribulation period, there will be people coming to know Christ. And in fact, very large numbers of them will be coming to him. And these are people who many of them, they will come to Christ and then many will be martyred. And it says that they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. God is the one who makes people righteous. But we also have a responsibility to respond to his calling. And so here, these believers are recognized because they did so. They also washed their robes. They responded to God's call. They confessed their sins and they asked God for forgiveness. And God gave them the robe. So here we see uh, both God's uh, sovereign choice and God's uh, grace in extending that righteousness to us and taking our sins. And we also see our responsibility that we need to be involved in the process of sanctification. We can't just, you know, lean back and ah, we'll just take a rest and God's going to do all the work and, and make us holy. No, God doesn't want us to be lazy. He wants us to be obedient to the commands that he gives to us. And then there's some promises uh, for these believers in protection. Verse 16, he says, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Many blessings are going to be bestowed on the believers. Although they were martyred and face truly horrible torment during their last days on earth, uh, as they're martyred and tortured because of their belief in Christ, it'll be worth it. And so God's making a promise. Look, even though you suffered for that period of time, you will not suffer ever again. Uh, we're, I'm reminded by the verse in Romans 8.18, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The trials and the difficulties we go through now are nothing in comparison to what he has for us. Your chronic pain, your sickness, your illness, your financial difficulties, Uh, your relational challenges with other people, uh, the sins or the the gossip or the the just when people gossip against you or betray you or betray your confidence, none of these things are worth 
being compared to what Christ has for us in eternity. So next time you're facing trials and difficulties in the moment, remember what God has in store for you. Remember that uh, eternal perspective. Remember these promises of protection. So I'm going to go back and look at those real quick. Uh, it says that they shall be before the throne and that they shall hunger no more. They will never hunger or thirst. God will provide for all of their needs. Uh, sorry, moving back says he will shelter them. So he's going to protect them. No one's going to be able to hurt them anymore. Um, it says the sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. There will be no more natural disasters which will bother us. Uh, the lamb will be their shepherd. Uh, so we can directly follow Jesus and he will lead us. It says he will guide them to springs of living water. Uh, he will give us eternal life. And it says that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Believers will have perfect joy forever. So this is a really exciting chapter showing us God's mercy, even in the midst of this great tribulation with sorrow, with suffering, wrath and judgment against sin. God is saving people. That's what he does. God is in the business of saving people. What application can we make? invite more people to join this grand celebration. Spurgeon once said, someone asked, will the heathen who has never heard the gospel be saved? It is more a question with me whether we who have heard the gospel and failed to give it to those who have not can be saved. So sometimes we think about all these theological questions. Can a person who's never heard the gospel be saved? What we should be thinking about is what can I do to make sure everybody hears? What can I do to give out these invitations? God is the judge. God will decide those cases. But the fact that so many people have still not heard should drive us to do everything we can to give them an opportunity to hear. That means going out. Jesus said, go and make disciples. That means taking initiative. A fisherman cannot catch fish unless he throws a hook or a net into the water. You cannot catch people unless you first share the gospel. One of my favorite verses is Matthew 9, 36 through 38. I'll just read 37 and 38. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This passage has been very meaningful in my own life. Almost 20 years ago, my family moved overseas for a one-year commitment to be workers for the Lord in that place. And then halfway through that year, I was contemplating this verse, pray for more workers in the harvest. I was looking around, well, there's a vast harvest field here. Pray for more workers. And I kept thinking, why not me? Why can I not be a worker? And then, here I still am 20 years later. God said, you should be a worker, and that's where I want you to stay. So I'd ask the same to you. Why not you? You can, and you should be a worker in this harvest. There's a great harvest field here, but the workers are still far too few. Many, work, many believers are not workers in the harvest at all. They might go to church week after week and sit there and listen and go home without ever helping. They're content to leave the work for the trained professionals. Let the pastor or the missionary do that. That's their job, isn't it? Well, it is, but it's also yours. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says that the leaders of the church are to train up, to equip the saints, sorry, to equip the saints for the works of service. Every saint is to be involved. Every saint, every believer is to be working. Every believer has a role. Elton Trueblood once said, evangelism is not a professional job for a few trained men but is instead the unrelenting responsibility of every person who belongs to the company of Jesus. So Jesus, one of his signature character qualities was compassion. Do you feel compassion for the lost people around you? Every day you go to work, you might pass many people in subways or buses or the cars next to you on the road. They might be listening to music, playing games on their phones, they might be listening to the radio. What are they doing? They need the Lord. What are you doing? 
you need to share with them. These people, they get up and they go to work and they, they work and they work and they work and they work long hours and they make money and they go traveling and they, they take Instagram photos and they, they show their wonderful life on Facebook and they get more and more wealth and more and more things and try to retire early. But what is it? What does it accomplish for them if they gain the whole world and yet lose their soul? They're like sheep without a shepherd. Tell them the gospel. Tell them that they need Jesus. So I want to make this very specific uh, for a minute. We've, we've seen God's vision for the world and how we can be part of it. We've seen that he wants people from all tribes, all languages, all peoples to come to know him. And it's our job to invite them. So I want you to write down a list of people who you know that don't know the Lord. Just write down a list at least five names or 10 names on your list. And then I want you to pray about what you should do with this list. What you should, what should you do with this list of unbelievers? At the very least, you can pray for them. And then would, might God move you to share the gospel with some of them? Now, I'm not going to tell you what to do with this list, but pray and ask God to lead you. What should you do with this list of names of people who are not yet saved. What would God have you to do for them? And then after prayer and reflecting, write down what God says to you. Write down how the Holy Spirit convicts you of what you should do with this list. Is there anything you need to obey? Is there anyone you need to tell? Uh, this chapter in Revelation 7 is so exciting as we see God's mercy in, in his sealing of believers, his protecting of them, and his call for them to be evangelists. And then we see the result of their work, this great multitude of people who are saved. We can be there at the end of the age. How joyous and what a great celebration that will be. We can also invite others to join us. I hope that's what each of us will do. If you enjoyed this study on Revelation 7, I would invite you to subscribe to this channel, Study and Obey, so you can receive the rest of the Bible studies on this book and other books of the Bible. God bless and see you next time.